Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. This is Derek Feldman with Achieve. So glad you're, that you're with us today. Uh, and I hope that you had a wonderful end of your fundraising season towards the, uh, the end of 2012. Well, this is a new year, so new goals and, and everything else. And I'll say that uh, the session that we have today was actually a request by a couple organizations that were really interested in starting off the new year because they were really, they, they're more in the small shop area with either one person or a couple people hired for the organization. And so we thought, well, why not? Why not start the year for, for some talking about some of the small shop fundraising ideas as well? Uh, if you're joining us, of course, as a Festival of Children member or any other member of our Achieve Access program, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you can have a copy of this presentation by logging in later. If you need credit for anything, feel free to follow up uh, in the email after this. And of course, if you have any questions uh, after the presentation today, please do let us know. I'll say too that we'll probably uh, get through most of the information in about 45 minutes or so, leave the last eight to 10 minutes uh, there for questions to make sure and get you out before the hour. And then also, uh, if you if you do need anything with regards to uh, some of the recordings and have trouble accessing them, please just email us later and we'll make sure and get that to you. So as I mentioned, this session was a, a, a really is happening because of a request by several organizations, and we've we've had this session in the past several times, uh, maybe two or three years ago, but we haven't uh, discussed it uh, recently. And we felt well now more than ever, it's probably as important as some of the organizations that we've encountered, of course are trying to figure out how to get out of the sort of small shop uh, area and build their organizations. Uh, and or we've got another group that has also come to us and said, you know, we're a small shop. We probably uh, will be a small organization. But can you help us or give us some ideas on how to operate fundraising so that we can accomplish what we need, um, but yet incorporate some of the key aspects? And we'll be doing that today. Um, today's conversation will focus on three primary pieces, and that will include uh, what you should be doing on the actual annual fund side of things, how you should structure yourself, and then the third one is uh, how you had to use donors and volunteers a little bit more. Those are the three key areas that we'll discuss uh, throughout the day. And of course, if you have any questions, go ahead and put those into the GoTo uh, panel that's on your screen, and we'll get to that uh, towards the end of the discussion. So first and foremost, let's talk about small shop when, uh, and as we do this, we have to discuss some assumptions first because what's challenging here is I'll say that fundraising in small organizations tends to go to the wayside when we see that other challenges that the organization is dealing with, uh, really overcome the priority of out there raising money or getting things done on time when it comes to solicitations and so forth. And so, one of the things that you'll have to understand in small shop is that some smaller issues that might happen with bigger organizations tend can be more um, overwhelming for some small organizations only because there isn't a lot of infrastructure staffing size there to address those and so we've we look at it and say well there are probably four issues or assumptions that we're going to go into this presentation with but I'll, I'll say that there are assumptions, but there are also things that you'll need to handle in order to effectively fundraise uh, before that. Now, this conversation isn't about these four, but it's something that you'll have to address to make sure that the discussions that we're going to have around fundraising are uh, will at least be more advantageous and successful for you. The first one that we'll say is, in the first one that we have here is around the case for support. And this is a perfect time, again, to have this discussion, is that before you go out and enact any fundraising programs uh, for your small shop organization, you really need to ensure that you understand what you need to raise money for this year and what is maybe the next couple of years look like and, and why and how you're going to plan to get that. One of the things when the case for support, I, you know, case for supports are used to be really long and drawn out kind of things. And that's not necessarily what I'm saying here. Um, what, what I'm saying is, is what is the goal for this year and how much you need to raise? What are the particular things each program needs to raise? Uh, and um, why are we needing to raise those dollars? Is there anything changed in the community? Uh, one of the things that I usually ask small shop organizations to do is to give to their board at the beginning of the year a one page, just a one page simple, this is our fundraising goal. 
uh, this goal consists of these three or four things that we're going to try and raise money for this year. One of them obviously being general operations and maybe one or two different programs. And the reason why we feel like this is such an important reason to raise this money is obviously one of them is mission related, but there might be other reasons like, for instance, that we need to expand this program or we want to help more people. We've got a waiting list for what we're trying to do. So that one page document serves is what I call just an abbreviated case statement for that year to say this is the goal. These are the different program pieces. And uh, obviously, this is this is what and how I think we're going to raise the money. What I like to do then is share that with a um, with the organization's volunteers so that they understand uh, what you're trying to do. Now, you can go out and create. Don't get me wrong. You can go out and create a very long case statement and and spend all of this time. You know, if you're a one person shop, you're going to you might spend all week trying to create that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have that because you should. But for right now, in the step that we're talking about, an abbreviated case statement will really help you and the organization just understand where you're trying to go. The other thing that I would say in this piece, too, is that as I as I look at the case statement, is that I start to begin thinking about the people that will be assigned to raise money in those categories, including yourself if you're the executive director or if you're a development person in a small organization. And so, for instance, if I say my goal is this, uh, it consists of these three programs that we're trying to raise money for. The lead person in each one of these programs is XYZ committee member or volunteer or myself. And um, we'll discuss later. I get, we'll discuss later how the approaches will be. But that's who's going to be responsible at helping us trying to reach those goals. And so, in essence, I've almost created an abbreviated development document out of that case statement, too. The second thing is that uh, that case statement is usually defined by some sort of strategy and direction about where you want to go. Of course, this really means strategic planning, and and that's not what this conversation is about. But you do need to under you do have to help other people around you, your foundations, your donors, at least understand what the strategic goal is. We want to serve this amount of people. We want to do all of that. And so, if you haven't done that already, at least for this year, you're going to need that as you go out and, and raise support. The other thing that you might want to consider in this strategic direction, if it's going to take you a couple of years, sometimes small shops, you know, require them a little bit longer to maybe reach or attain a goal, is to say, you know, the larger goal by 2012 or 20, uh, 12, 2015, obviously going back to like last year, but, uh, but 2015 is, you know, 100 people we're going to help. This year we're going to try and do 30 and so forth. So just incrementally letting people know where you're trying to stand. Again, a one-page simple document that helps them understand where the potential direction is. And then I would say that the third one that, that I often see that, that we need to assume is that the board has agreed to engage in fundraising in, in some element. I'll be honest that, uh, that small shops tend to remain that way because the board hasn't stepped up to try and, to try and take over some aspects of the fundraising. The challenge here is that, you know, you only have so much manpower. If you're a one person organization or even say a one to three person organization, everybody's doing a lot of different roles. Everybody's handling aspects of fundraising and, and, and everything else. But the challenge with it is, is that you're only going to have so much bandwidth. And the question is, is that how can we set up the staff to be most successful? Well, probably the most successful the staff can be is having direct interaction with some donors. Um, as will the board, but more importantly, the staff will be. So it's, well, how do we free up the staff then to have more direct conversations with donors, knowing that when our staff or executive director or development person who is hired by the small shop interacts with that donor, the likelihood of getting a gift that time or even after that is very, very high. So we want to maximize the staff's interaction with outsiders, which means that anything that that the board can do to alleviate that doesn't uh, that sort of takes away from that staff having that ability to interact with somebody is going to be very important. For instance, as you'll see later when we talk about structure and sizing of fundraising within small shops, that if the board can handle some of the annual fund, direct mail, email, some of those smaller things that we've talked about in the past, that can that can help you as you go out and try and raise individual dollars from personal conversations. 
because in reality, the board doesn't necessarily have to connect directly with donors, but they can support you and take some of that administrative element off. The other thing I'd say, too, is that, you know, you are going to need a couple people on your board who have the ability and are willing to go out and, and ask for money from you or, or for you. And so that would mean, of course, that whether it's a development committee, a group of people, but you do just need some askers out there. I mean, the more people out there asking on your behalf, obviously the odds are much better in your uh, in your favor there. And so when we think about the board, and we'll get to the structure a little bit later, they've got to agree to fundraise to a certain extent. I, you know, I want everybody to go out and ask for money. I'm a realist and understand that some of the board members may not be able to based on comfort level and so forth. Is that, but we do need a core group of maybe two to three people that can go out and ask money um, for us, uh, hopefully, or at least connect those people to us as well. And then the last one is that, um, and this kind of seems funny, but um, one of the things that happens in small shops is as we see marketing and communications that we'll even track with clients before we'll start working with them. And I'll mention that we've got two or three clients where foundation has asked us to come in and really help them for a full year. And they've only have one person on their staff where, you know, we're trying to look at how they're doing things and, and trying to massage stuff. And that's what I'm going to show you later on. And, and in there, what we have found is, is that prior to, prior to us, you know, sitting down and thinking about all the things that they've sent out over the course of the last year, the communication, the events, or anything else their volunteers, is that it really seems very scattered. And the communication efforts um, are all over the place because what we'll find is that the organization that we were working with will have a lot of great opportunities. And, you know, it's kind of, you, and I know this happens with a lot of us, it's trying to understand what's an opportunity, what's something that I should be spending time on versus sort of this long-term trajectory of, well, it's important, it's nice, it's not a necessity right now, but, but you know, we'll get to it later. And what we tend to see is that some organizations, because they want to be inclusive and see if something bubbles up, is that they'll start to communicate all of that and they'll start to disperse that through newsletters and everywhere that they were going. And it was interesting as we were even working with this other organization that over the course of just three months, there were, there were about 15 to 20 different messages the organization was sending out. And the, the one person, the executive director who works for the organization said, well, you know, I was hoping that one of these would take off and kind of move from there. The challenge, though, is that everything was diluted and there wasn't anything specific and clear. Now is a good time to tell everybody, this is what we're doing. This is where we're going. And, and as a small organization, try to help people understand how they can get involved in those things and make that communication very clear um, rather than just taking everything on and seeing if something sticks. Uh, so be cautious about that as, as you go through it. All right. So let's go ahead now then and get into some of the small shop pieces. Remember, those are some elements that you'll have to work on in advance um, prior to trying to implement some really good sounds uh, fundraising programs. So think through with your board and think through some of that strategic direction. The first one that we want to talk about out of the three that I discussed when we first started is that fundraising is a system that can be managed and automated. You know, if you're a one-person organization, do you have the time to think about generating all of this correspondence? Do you have the time to handle all of the administrative aspects that might go into the organization? Um, what you might want to consider, too, is thinking about how can I, how can we as an organization automate some of the fundraising that we do in order for me to spend my hours, my time during the day focused on getting the maximum result, which usually means that you are having direct conversations with people that can give you things for the organization, whether that's resources, whether that's a company giving you assets or in-kind or a sponsorship, all of those things. We have to free the time away that you're doing some of that other element. The, the other thing that we'll think about when fundraising the system is managed and, and automated is that things begin to work in the background for you while you're going out and doing those things uh, too as well. So for instance, you know, if somebody gives online that, that there's a process or if somebody gives you a donation, that somebody is running a process of doing a thank you note and the only thing you're doing is signing it. 
um, rather than you generating all of those letters and so forth, which is a great job for a volunteer. So we have to divide the fundraising scope uh, for the full organization and say, what is automated, what can be automated, and where do we really want to spend your time? One of the things you should consider right now is look back at 2012, if you can. Think about a normal week outside of fundraising campaign time. So end of year might be a little tricky, might not be a good example to look at. And look at it and say, this week, this is the common thing that I do related to fundraising. And what we'll find is, is that even if you're having a meeting, well, what do you need? What do you have to do prior to that meeting for you that maybe a volunteer or somebody else can help you with? And so look throughout your calendar and begin to think about the different aspects of the fundraising job that you're performing and seeing if we can parcel that out. It's almost like you need to become the best outsourcer of your, of your task related to fundraising as you go forward. The other thing that I would, I would say too, is you look back at the last year and where you spent most of your time. What we'll, what we'll see is not only this increase in administrative work when it comes to fundraising, which can bog you down a lot, but the second thing is, is that we'll also see um, time spent with tactics that probably won't yield as much either. A good exercise is to look back at 2012 and think through all the different things that were successful with fundraising, some new pieces that you did try, and then, of course, uh, some other aspects that, that were very, very successful. And look at this year and say, you know, if we do want to experiment with something, um, usually an experimentation means it will take more of your time that if we do experiment with something, this, this is the element that I'll lead and this is only one project or one place that we'll experiment it with. So we'll need to make sure that both the administrative and some of that experimentation doesn't eat into a lot of your time uh, when you need it. So as we think about the fundraising system, and you might have seen this before from us, is that the fundraising system is a flow. And so, for instance, when you start the process of getting somebody's name, as you'll see on the left-hand side, and bring them through a system of different communication, they then become a donor with you, and then they become a repeat donor and, and so forth. Well, let's go ahead and break that down just a little bit more. So when we acquire donors, we usually have they are acquired from lists, they're acquired from relationships, through marketing partnerships, through events, through all these different ways. But we acquire a name or a person in some method. So the, the thing that you'll need to think about here is, you know, if you have a marketing partnership, how can you as a small organization set up that partnership as the staff and then utilize a volunteer to help manage smaller aspects of the administrative uh, elements of that partnership. A good case in point is we were working with this small organization. They had one big event where they brought in the faith community together to learn about their organization so that hopefully these uh, different congregations throughout the city would, con would, um, would recommend them to their, um, to their individuals that were part of the congregation to support. And what happened usually at the beginning was that that executive director established that relationship with each, each congregation. And at a certain point, she then said, OK, great. Now that, you know, you're, you agree that we're allowed to come speak and everything else. I have a volunteer that manages some of the logistical stuff of everything to deal with our faith based congregations. And so they'll handle, you know, giving you the logos, giving you all of the smaller things that tend to eat into our time. The time was effectively spent you know, focusing on developing the relationship and solidifying the quote unquote deal. And all of the other logistics were sent to a very great, uh, highly organized board member or volunteer, a senior level, senior type of volunteer who could manage the other aspects of it. And the other thing that we started to realize with the organization is that this executive director had many, not only that partnership, but a lot of different partnerships that started to eat into her time and what she really needed was a great volunteer out there to manage that who had been maybe a retired or an administrative uh, person in the past. And they actually didn't have that person on their board at that time. And they went out and recruit and found a really great volunteer who was a recent retiree who would, who would fill that role. So that was a case of going out and recruiting for the type of person uh, that they needed. Then when we think about the second thing that happens is after we start to get people interested, they start to receive co some communications uh, from us. 
And when we see that uh, communications, and whether that's a direct mail appeal or whether that's just our e-newsletter, all of these different things that we send out to hopefully drum up interest in what we're doing, well, those aspects tend to suck a lot of time out of our agendas and our schedules during the week. Uh, because as a small shop, you start to do that kind of work where you're just creating all of it yourself. Um, only you know, you're great leaders from that perspective. But again, here is where we can begin to incorporate some development committee members as well as some volunteers to come in and then at that point begin to develop the newsletters or training them on how to create some of that content so that what you're doing is actually refining the message, not creating completely 100% of the time. And then as we go through, what we also realize is that when people become donors for the first time, you know, we have to understand how much staff interaction those people will have with you. And then vice versa, when they move to maybe a mid-level or even become a major donor. And from that perspective, what we usually find in small organizations is to say that we'll use a lot of volunteers at the lower levels, the ones before, and I'll go back to here, but once they reach a certain mid-level or higher level, those relationships elevate to the staff person. And that is very common in a big organization that has different giving, le- giving officers at different levels. It's the same type of thing, but instead of having a paid giving level officer, you're actually using a volunteer. And what's really great about that is that if you use it correctly and say, you know, our annual donors, maybe those between zero and $100, will obviously see, receive a thank you letter signed by the executive director or the board chair, but a follow-up phone call will be done by the volunteer staff. And maybe once a year, we'll have that volunteer, um, volunteer staff or committee member follow up with them and just check in. Well, when it comes to, say, the mid-level donor range, in that perspective, it could be, well, at this level, we're going to have the staff manage those relationships one-on-one rather than the board, even if they open them up. Uh, to us as well, and then even more as the major donors and corporations and foundations. So you'll have to say to yourself to break down the donor levels that you have. So if it's zero to 100, 100 to 250, and so forth, and say, at what point do we have the staff directly interact all of the time to how can we use our volunteers to do that sum of interaction with us to manage some of those relationships uh, to as well. And what we've also found, too, is that this is a great opportunity for not only development committee members, but also volunteers who are looking for really meaningful relationships, um, meaningful you know, opportunities with the organization. And so if you said, I'm going to give you a specific job, any donor that gives between zero and 100, I'd like you to call them twice a year, once to thank them and another time to check in and ask them if they need anything and communicate directly with them for me. Because... I'm going to be, as this, as the executive director, focused on donors that give us anything above 100 or anything above 250, whatever that mark is for yourself. Um, the more that you can begin to, to outsource some of that personal communication will also mean that it'll add a ton of value when it comes to the donor actually having direct communication from the organization, and even though you're not providing it. So uh, somebody else's. I, I say plain giving in here. That's that's a hard one because for a lot of small organizations, plain giving may not be um, on the outlook yet. But as you go through, that's usually something managed by by the staff level. I'd also say too that as you go through, is um, decide at, you know at the beginning of the year as a small organization you know, when you want to have your campaigns. Um, and that would be, we want to do a direct mail or we want to do an email or we want to do something else. Each one of these campaigns, if you can plan those out now and then begin to assign those tasks to certain types of volunteers would be great too as well. Um, when we were working with that, that small organization, what we found is that the executive director's time was getting eaten up by getting quotes from printers and getting things with other vendors. Well, what was really great is that, you know, why not have a volunteer ask for quotes and do some of that or, you know, find somebody else within some of their other volunteer structures, some of their volunteers who provide program where, where they would have volunteers come to their facility and they had some downtime, but they were really great qualified volunteers. And so we started to give them jobs that, you know, quite frankly, the executive director was, you know, didn't need to be a part of that, getting quotes and doing all those things. 
Well, what happened though is that we got to that point by saying we want to have three campaigns or we want to do two direct mail campaigns or three different emails. And so what are the things that we need to do to try and get them to, to get them all set up? Well, you know, we'll need a printer quote. We'll need somebody to write the content. We'll need somebody to uh, work with the post office. And so we started parceling out particular jobs throughout the year and the volunteers began to align themselves with those jobs that they really cared about. Some better on admin, some thought they could at least give a first draft of a, of a, of a direct mail or something else. And, and it really helped to create much more of a team-based atmosphere with using volunteers. And the executive director was spending more of their t- more, most of their time during that process, not focused on you know, postage rates and everything else, but actually uh, focused on going out and getting sponsors for their next event, and which she was very, very appreciative of. So you can use some campaign forms and planning. And this is something that you could use, and I have copies of this if you need it, but you could use this to talk with your volunteers and say, so this is what we all, this is the, the kind of direct mail we want to do. You know, can you find and can you help out and assist in that manner? And then lastly, as you'll see on this other form too, is that it just kind of gives you some additional options. But so I think the focus, as you'll see here, is that we need to automate and manage the fundraising elements, not to allow it to consume the administrative, some of the outside partnerships, and some of those things that we can give to volunteers. Structure your different donation levels, and within each of those donation levels, consider how volunteers and staff will be a part of those relationships. You know, if you're a one person or even a two person uh, organization, you can't do it all. And so you're going to have to use volunteers strategically in there to take over some aspects of it. So make sure that you, you think about that uh, in terms of some of your fundraising. So now let's talk about the structure a little bit more. As we think about development structure, we need to optimize it going forward for growth uh, too as well. I think the struggle for most small organizations is then, you know, when do we take the leap to hire that development director to try and raise the resources that we want? And, uh, you know, I'm sure you're probably thinking, well, if we hire a development director, they should be at least able to raise their own salary. You know, we've heard that so many times. Well, I have to break the news to you in the first year. It typically doesn't happen. And the reason why is because there are so many relationships that need to be developed. And also in a small shop organization like yourselves, the challenge is is that for so long, the organization has been affiliated with you or that one or two people that have been a part of it. And so adding one new person to the mix and trying to get them to understand how those relationships, uh, you know, begin to transfer those relationships can be really tough. Um, we, uh, we have a paper called Development Director or Not, which is a series of different questions about whether or not you should hire a development director. And one of the common misconceptions is, tr- is having high expectations in the first year, when in reality it will take a couple years, um, a year to year and a half, to try and get them to a point where they're not only raising enough of their own salary, but they are, but they are also bringing in a substantial amount more uh, for the organization. So going from zero to 1,000 uh, within you know the first year can be a little tough. So here are the different structure elements, and we're going to go through each one of those. We're going to talk from just the fundraising side, not necessarily a full staffing size, but just the fundraising side uh, in itself. So first, usually what we see in this structure is uh, in the beginnings of a small organization is a board uh, board of directors, and then there's an executive director. And typically, the executive director is handling all aspects of fundraising. Uh, and at this point, they're starting to use some volunteers. If you if you don't have the salary or um, resources, this is where you really got to use the model we just talked about, creating those different donor levels and then having volunteers handle stewardship aspects of it and some of the administrative for you. In addition to this model is that we start to parcel out jobs to different board members. And usually it's not uncommon here because the board is more of a working board, quote unquote, which I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, And that working board will allow you to uh, at least handle some of those jobs that you typically haven't been able to. As the organization starts to get a little bit of success, they start to move, uh, they start to question whether or not, or they start to get bigger and they question whether or not to hire a development director. 
our recommendation is to actually pull back and first start with the two things that are probably consuming the executive director right away, and that would be some part-time development assistance or even contracted grant proposal writers. Um, and let's talk about grant proposal writing for a second. You know, again, this is about your time and energy. You should consider, um, if you are a one-person or two-person shop, outsourcing the grant proposal writing um, because what that, to a contractor to help you write those, only because the amount of time and energy that can consume you, you could use to go out and do true solicitation work with. Now, the thing is, is that you have to actually use that time to go out and ask for money versus doing something else administratively so that we have more value there. But when we think about contracted proposal writing, some people don't like to do it because, you know, it's an expense and all of that. Well, you know, in the expense side, if you're out there raising sponsorship dollars and you had more time doing that, uh, obviously um, it would be more in your favor to contract it out. The second reason that we typically see in contracted grant proposal writers that we hear is, well, you know, they don't know how to write about us or anything else, and we would hate for them to, you know, send something along that isn't reflective of what we do. Well, you would never do that anyway. I mean, and in the beginning, yes, the you're going to have to hold somebody's hand so that they understand how to write like you, but you have past proposals, you have past things that they can work from, and a really good proposal writer can take that and move with it and begin to create the content for you that you need for an effective proposal. Again, do we want you sitting down and writing all this proposal writing or out there actually asking and getting answers for, for work? Um, the other thing that I would say, too, as we look here, it's a development assistant. You know, we always recommend an hourly uh, person to come in every once in a while and do processing of gifts. Or even if you know that you have a huge event or something else going on, or you might need a volunteer to serve in that role for a little bit so that they can take some of the administrative off if you're moving it, if it's a little bit more complex than what a volunteer can handle. And what we'll find in this structure with the board of directors who still serve as going out and managing some of the relationships of the donors in, every, in each of those levels, the executive director handling a lot of the ask, an outside contractor when it comes to proposal writing, and maybe a contracted hourly person for some higher level as, uh, development assistant work, is that we'll have a really great team and we're able to grow without effectively going into a uh, development director where you hire the development director and they're not going to get the results. So in this model, it sort of grows with, with the organization. We'll, we'll also see then that the development assistant over time might become more of a full-time role or a 40-hour week. We still are outsourcing some of our grant proposal writing, and we might start to think about using some people to help us with events. And the nice thing about this next structure that we'll see is that we, we see the event piece beginning to take off where it has, and finding somebody hourly or at least somebody to help with that secure sponsorships might be really, really great. Still yet, you haven't committed to this full-time, big, expensive resource of an individual fundraiser, but you have a team now beginning to form around the executive director, still outsourcing something like contracted proposal writing, and you're starting to bring in uh, and starting to put people behind sort of events or anything else that you want to do. In this role and model, the executive director is still responsible um, and or development director is still responsible for going out and asking for money uh, with the board, doing managing some of those relationships at the different levels. And then I'd say, too, as we start to see uh, that model then going into a development director role, um, and in that we start to either let the development assistant go or a grant proposal writer, we start to bring it more in-house. And what you'll notice in this system is that long term, we have now grown the staffing and the fundraising stack has actually grown with the level of revenue coming into the organization so it can sustain the personnel side rather than jumping to a development director right away. And then long term, you might look at a structure like this as you obviously the organization continues to grow. So let me go ahead and sort of look back at all the different models and pieces that might happen. Uh, as I mentioned, you've got potentially different scenarios here. You have to outsource some of those volunteer elements that we talked about based upon and define donor levels that you have or, or your events. 
The second thing that you'll see here is that we start to bring in hourly or contracted people to begin to take some of the administrative and all of the non-personal solicitation components off of the executive director or the board's plate. And then as we continue, we start to increase their hours and increase their involvement and begin to hire staff appropriated to the particular things that bring in the most revenue, maybe an event or anything else, still keeping it manageable, such as like an hourly and so forth. And then over time, potentially hiring a development director as well. In each one of these scenarios, it grows over time. It's not, you know, have I seen an organization jump from all of this all at once in one year? No. And if they have, they usually had to come back and go back to one of the structures before. But in this structure, it's continuing to use those volunteers and increasing staff appropriately based upon revenue and what you're bringing in from the fundraising side and not jumping to an end potential conclusion that you would maybe want, which is very, very important when it comes to the solicitation. And lastly, as I would say, too, um, one of the things that we'll see here in the board of directors and executive director development assistant area is, is that when we start to hire professional staff we to do certain jobs like that, uh, it, you'll have to keep in mind that when you're moving from volunteers doing those jobs to a staff member, that it requires a conversation with you as an organization to say to that board member or board you know, we are getting bigger, which requires additional fundraising or solicitation skills. Therefore, we, we think it's now appropriate to hire a professional to do that, to support, in addition, the board out there doing their work, too. You'll have to make sure and transition that because what we don't want it to seem is, well, what, you know, why can't the board continue to do this? Because the answer will be, well, there's a reason the expertise and skill may not be there, but we still need the board to, to go out and connect us or manage some relationships for us. But doing proposal writing or doing some other uh, aspects of recording of gifts and, and all of that can now be done as we gotten, you know, have, have become more complex in everything that we're doing. We might need some new and additional professional people. So each time that we've helped an organization move from, say, really small and started to add fundraising staff, we're very clear with the board as to the reason not, not that goes beyond just growth. Hey, we're making more money. We need more time. We don't have enough volunteers, but that we also need a potential skill that may not exist within the board. And it's a skill that might not, that is a professional skill that we may not be able to use and bring back to volunteers. So now as we get to the last aspect of our small shop fundraising, it's talking about leveraging relationships. So, so far we've talked about automating different aspects of the annual fund work that we've discussed using volunteers. The second thing that we talked about is optimizing that great volunteer and then slowly bringing staff in when appropriate using potential contractors or hourlies over time. And then this third one would be leveraging relationships. When we think about leveraging relationships, we do that with both donors and we do that on the volunteer side. Most small shops uh, lack a huge marketing budget. <laughs> we just do. And so because you do that, you're always in a mode of acquisition of new contacts and new people. You're always trying to go out there and, and go out and discuss the, and, and spread your message as much as possible. And so as we look at this, we need our donors right now to go on and spread stuff for us. And we need our prospective donors to help us find the people that will give to us. And so every time we lead, leave, con I'm sorry, leave conversations with our donors, and you'll see with our volunteers, we need to ask certain questions. And you have to think about it from a marketer standpoint, just because you don't have a marketing budget. So one of the things that as you leave conversations or even at the beginning, one of the, one of the elements I like to say to a donor is say, you know, before we leave, I'd also like to talk about, um, other people you think we should be talking with because as you probably guess, we don't have a big budget. And so we rely a lot on word of mouth and it's word of mouth that helps us to continue to not only attract new people to the cause that we're doing, but it also helps us to bring in new resources. And that might be the way that you can support us in addition to your gifts. That kind of very transparent discussion is very, very good. 
So one of the things is you end donor conversations, make that statement and talk about them and say, well, you know, you heard me talk about everything that we're doing this year. Is there anybody that you know within your network that you think would be interested in discussing this? And then also, is there anybody else within all your professional societies that you belong to, your uh, the churches, the anything that you're affiliated with that you might know somebody that would like this or even consider it? Um, and then lastly, you know, can I give you materials that you can forward on to somebody? Uh, what I would really like is if you could help introduce me to those people. But if you don't feel comfortable by doing that directly with me, uh, can you at least forward on the materials to those individuals and, uh, you know, give them my number so that we can maybe sit down and they can initiate uh, as well? Because not everybody was, not every donor is interested in, in doing that, but at least they might be interested in um, uh, just, they might be interested in actually sending materials for you without necessarily always introing you together on an, on an email too. And then what I also like to do, too, is that I begin to create prospect lists and see how these people are connected. And that's where you as an executive director or even a board volunteer can say, so this is who Derek knows. These are the people that he suggests that we talk to. He really only knows three or four of them. The other ones he didn't feel as comfortable but would pass that materials on to him. And we said that we would leave uh, when we left here, too. The other thing that I would recommend, too, is you talk to donors is you must create group giving options uh, when it comes to some small shop fundraising. And that means that as you go to your donors and ask for gifts to attract more donors, because you don't necessarily have the ability to buy lists or anything else, is that you ask them, say, hey, Derek, we, you know, we have a $500, uh, a $500 um, uh, thing that we're trying to raise money for. It's, it's, it's for a piece of equipment that will really help the kids that we serve. Now, I know that last year that you, Ray, that you gave us $250. What I was at, and I know that this might be above what you can do, what I was wondering is that would you be willing to go out and look at your friends and family, your, your business networks and others to raise the additional on our behalf? And because what that will do is also bring new supporters to the organization and help us. So I always like to, in small shop uh, discussions, is to try and create group giving opportunities so that these people that believe in us can actually create some options and bring people to our organization too. Those are all great things that you should consider when you're doing some donor conversations uh, together. When it comes to our volunteers, it's very, very similar. Uh, because volunteers tend to be great donors, this is where I really, really use the volunteer aspects of group engagement. Because volunteers, uh, the, if they're volunteering and you sit down with them, uh, I always like to sit down at the beginning of the year and say, you know, would you've had a great personal experience. Would you bring more people with you next time that we can create maybe an experience for you and others uh, to have together? This could be your family, <clears throat> your business anywhere else. Because I would suspect if we get them there that they'll like it, of course, if you're talking to them and so on. And so we need to utilize group volunteerism really effectively to have people experience your work that you can eventually lead them to ask for money. The other thing is, is that as you create materials or can, you know, can they send materials out on your behalf, that's something you really want to focus on with your volunteers because they tend to be some of your biggest advocates because they're working directly with the organization in some manner. And so things like um, things like some small peer fundraising campaigns, you know, if you can give twenty five dollars, I always used our volunteers to ask them to spread a very small donation opportunity to their networks and friends. So if your organization has a need for. Um, you know, you want to raise a thousand dollars, but you might send, ask them to send an email on to their friends and family to give twenty five dollars on your behalf. That would be great. Volunteers are great peer fundraisers, and we really need to use them uh, from that perspective. And then I'd say, lastly, with some of our volunteers, is that volunteers want to also consider potentially new and unique opportunities. 
And that's where those opportunities we discussed earlier with these different levels, you might be able to bring them into those different levels and ask them to manage certain things for you. And so that meeting at the beginning might be really helpful to say, you know, have you enjoyed your experience? I've got three or four different specific volunteer opportunities that aren't necessarily publicized that we're looking for. And these are people that we're really wanting to um, bring into the organization. If you're not one of them and you know somebody else, please let us know who they are. And if you can reach out or help us reach out to them, that would be great. So it's almost asking your volunteers if, you know, if they would help you recruit a very professional, skilled volunteer to manage some of the things that we've discussed in fundraising. Okay, so now we're towards the end of our, our questions together. Uh, and so if you have any questions, feel free to put those in there. But just want to make sure and review with you the three things that we've seen in Small Shop. One is that we need to create an automated and manage a structure of volunteers based upon donor levels and giving. The second thing is that we need to create a development structure that over time can bring in staff at a slower pace based upon our revenue growth uh, within that time frame. And then thirdly, that we're using our do donors and volunteers to do our marketing, to do small group engagement together consistently throughout the year. All of this is based upon that you understand what the fundraising goal is that we talked about, you have that strategic direction of what you want to accomplish. The board has agreed to participate at certain levels within the fundraising element uh, too as well. And then lastly is that you're very targeted in this year about what you want to communicate and let some of the other stuff not bog you down that won't have a good outcome. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the questions. I know some of you may have to leave, so feel free uh, uh, to do that. Uh, one of the first questions is, you know, can we get, um, can we get the presentation? Absolutely. The second question, there's another question in here, too, around, you know, can I receive some of the uh, planning documents? Yes, we'll get those to you, too. Uh, the third element is, Derek, you mentioned using a lot of volunteers. Uh, some of our board members are not are not necessarily the right people for this. Would you go to them and ask them to find other volunteers? Absolutely. Um and that's, you know, uh, I, I'll talk about that small shop that we that we uh, have worked with. So one of their um, one of their individual um, uh, board members was from Lilly, uh, the big corporation. And what's, what was great about that individual is that she had a lot of great connections. But in she even verbally said, I'm very introverted. You know, I'm very I'm not very good at having these large discussions about this. But I know two or three people within my department or within a different department that I think I could feel, you know, that I think you're looking for based upon what you told me. And um, she was very good and instrumental about connecting them uh, to an organization, to the organization that, uh, to that individual that was really, really good. Now, I will say the only way that that has worked is that we we're very clear on what it is, the job that we needed. Uh, the other thing is that we actually created a one page just job description of the volunteer uh, opportunity and she used that to go approach that individual on our behalf. Um, had it been, you know, will you consider sitting down with them and going through that whole process, I don't think would have been uh, as successful uh, as we've you know, just talked about. So I would make sure that you still have all those elements for the board to do that. Um, the next question is, would you consider holding an event for your donors to discuss the different roles or discuss the direction each year. Yes, absolutely. Um, those are good. And that's also a great opportunity to bring in. If you are, um, if you're bringing the, if you're using volunteers and we've actually used this uh, strategy sometimes with organizations that do um, annual events where they bring donors together for like a thank you event or, or, you know, something else in that manner that will, that up there beyond the executive director, we've asked them to introduce and, and have those, have the individuals who are the volunteers working at different donor levels go around the room, introduce themselves because those are the names that they might hear if they get money or if they have questions. Remember, if we're, if we're using them at those different levels. So, uh, yes, I do. Um, I would say though that, you know, you're adding another event and that's my only caution to it that as you add another event, you have to just look at capacity and whether or not you can you can handle that. Um, if it, you might consider making sure that somebody like a volunteer who's very skilled can help you manage that event. 
And if it's your first one, give yourselves a good six to seven months to make sure and, and, and get it correctly done. Because I, I just always worry with organizations who might have another special event. Now they're doing a thank you event for their donors, which in all good best practices is great. But you can have maybe that same effect by using some volunteers to personally call them once or twice a year and you know manage less logistical or expense from, from that perspective. Uh, the next question is about emails. Uh, would you ask some volunteers to email donors? Um, yes, but you need to still manage that, like we talked about, manage that message. And when you're managing the message, I would, I typically say, you know, create the email and ask them just to forward it on, um, uh, whether it's from you or, you know, at least put their signature on it too as well. It, it tends to work really, really well that way. Um, and, and then lastly, when it comes to communication, sometimes we'll even use those volunteers to ask them to send like the, the newsletter out to them and so forth. It's based upon whether or not you have the right volunteers able to do that, that, that positioning and job. So, um, all right. Well, we are on five to the hour. I said we'd, uh, I said we'd depart here around this time. Um, if you do have any other questions, let me know. We appreciate you being with us on the first, uh, on the first session this year. We'll have a full series of different sessions, of course, throughout the rest of, of the year. I think next time is around fundraising collateral. We'll also have different interviews. Uh, once a month, we'll be bringing in new people to uh, give us uh, their insights as they're a part of an organization that we think is doing really well. So um, if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you again. Here's off to a great 2013. We'll talk soon.